We welcome all of our brethren on live stream tonight. And we pray that we'll have a good fellowship together in the truth. We're going to be in the book of Philemon. This will be our 10th lesson in this book. We'll be looking at verses 17 through 19. Now within spiritual life, reasoning is a very prominent part. Amen. And when I say reasoning, let me take a moment and define what I mean. I mean the drawing of inferences or conclusions through the use of reason. To talk with another individual or individuals so as to influence their actions and views. To talk with another to cause a change of mind. That's what we're talking about. We talk about reasoning. The basis of the reasoning, of course, is the Word of God. But in reason, you, you extract from the Word of God certain facts that can be put together to make valid thoughts, thoughts that are intended to be spawned by the Scripture. In the Scriptures, you know, God said to Israel, come, let us reason. <clears throat> he didn't mean come together and we'll quote various texts. That's not what he meant. That's not what I mean either. We do expect text to be quoted. <laughs> you understand. Come let us reason together. And if they did, something would happen. Your sins, though they be as scarlet, will be white as snow. That's just a come from this reasoning. And though they be red like crimson, they'll be as wool. And we go, but we're going to have to reason together for this to happen. This isn't going to happen by waving a wand over the people. Or saying a particular sentence over the people that imparts all that. That's not how it happens. It comes by reasoning together. When the truth is comprehended... And, what, and you see the implications of it. By the implications of it, I mean the stuff that's built on it. The things that are produced by it. When you see that, reasoning. Paul confronted Felix with a certain kind of reasoning. He reasoned with him. About righteousness, temperance, and the judgment to come. Yeah, see, you can say those three words, but there's a whole body of things that are implied by the words. There are some things that are said about each one of these. And by reason, he sought to move Felix to do something about this. That's a part of the scripture. When Paul was in Thessalonica in the synagogue, he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. See, a lot of preaching is not reasoning. I'm, you may understand this, that uh, most of preaching that people hear is not reasoning. Yeah. It's just a lot of blab. That's about what it amounts to. It doesn't move people. It doesn't clarify the truth. It's not reasoning. When Paul went to Ephesus, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews. He was impacting the way people thought. See, that's what reasoning does. It, it changes or enhances the way people think. Yeah, that's right. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So if people think wrong, they will live wrong. Uh -huh. Amen. If they think right, they'll live right. And thinking right just doesn't happen by affirmation alone, it begins with affirmation, but after the affirmation, there's got to be reasoning. Oh, it's just a great... I think it's important course, to note for the young people that manipulation of emotions is not reasoning. No. Mm -hmm. And a whole lot of preaching also, over the years, I've realized finally is 
It's just a manipulation of oh, emotion. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh you're right. This same approach of reasoning was found in the ministry of John the Baptist. He not only said to repent, he, he reasoned. He, he reasons what led you to that conclusion. And the Lord Jesus, our blessed Lord, he reasoned with people about the truth. Moving to impact them with the truth and compel them to change their course of living and change their way of thinking. So reasoning, this is one of the highest forms of delivering the truth of God. Reasoning. Yeah, I'm sure you know this, and maybe you've experienced this. It was a while before you knew how to reason. <laughs> yeah, so I won't say any more about that, but there's a lot of preachers, they don't, they don't even know how to reason. They don't. That's why they don't reason, because they don't know how. Now, it includes a statement of facts. I want to be careful. To, it includes the statement of facts. But it also elaborates on the cause that upholds the facts and the rationality of conforming one's life to the facts. Now, our brothers and sisters do pretty well in this, but it's a, word, a good word to say that when you have a short, a, a reasonably brief period of time, don't get up and read a long text of Scripture. We can read the Bible. We don't come here really to just hear the Bible read. So if you feel incompetent in developing what's said and reasoning about it, ask God to help you in this because... It does. Well, you got examples in Scripture of people who read the Scripture, but then it didn't. They didn't sit down, yeah. <laughs> unless it was sat down to teach them reasoning. Now I'm bringing this up because that's what Paul is doing in our text. He, he's going to reason with Philemon. He's going to confirm how he himself views this situation. And he's going to reason with him to bring him into accord mm -hmm. with what he's, uh, what he's proposing. Verses uh, 17 through 19. He just finished asking him to receive Onesimus, to receive him, not as a servant, but, but as a brother. A beloved brother. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he has wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thy own self besides. <laughs> That's powerful. This is powerful, powerful reasoning. Now let's look at this text. If, let's know that's a good important word, reasoning if. It's, uh, it's when anything is simply or generally assumed to be done. It's a term of conditionality. If, and it'll state something that is assumed will be done, and on the basis of that being done, then they make another, another statement. What Paul is going to ask Philemon to do is conditioned upon what he now says. He first of all, God's going to lay down what we call a premise. If this is true, then do this. This is a powerful form of reasoning. If ye be risen with Christ, seek the things that are above. Amen. See? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. How can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? See, he lays down a fact, reasons upon it. Now, there's not a lot of this. There's not a lot of this in uh, the Christian world. Yeah. A lot of the times, I was just thinking of 
the preachers on the radio and, and such that I've heard that do reason, most of them reason on what they think the Bible means <laughs> rather than on the scriptures themselves. That's right. And see, you already mentioned this, but the, it does, the facts have to be laid out. That's but right. they don't do you much good unless it's reasoned on. It has to be reasoned on. Yeah. The modern approaches to living for Christ and doing the right thing too often exclude reasoning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. This, you, you ought to do this. Well, that's true, but yeah. let's reason together Amen. about this. We, if you want your sins to be that are scarlet to be white as snow, then that we're going to have to reason together. You have to come together. We're going to have to think together and reason together. And God's going to drive the right. <laughs> reasoning process. It's not going to be because they come together and arrive at a consensus where we, at least we all agree that that's not the purpose. The purpose of reasoning is to set forth the truth of what God will use to unify people's minds and then to elaborate on its implication, what, what is necessary is tied to it. The word if, it calls upon one to examine differing points of view. You're going to take this view, then state that view, then you, you got to put them together, but you're going to lay, lay them out in reasoning, lay it out before you. If you can see that what he's asking you to do is the right thing. If you can see that, then you'll do it. Reasoning is what clarifies that that vision. Reasonable. Reasonable. That's right. Yeah. Reasonable. Amen. <laughs> See, there's an enmity between the wisdom that's from beneath, as James said, and the wisdom that comes down from above. There's a. They're not just different. There's enmity. But when you reason, you'll take different views, but they're not inimical views. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily, they're not necessarily hostile mm -hmm. to one another. All right, well, if, if you count me, well, if you regard, I'm assuming the way you think about me, Philemon, but that be elaborate on this. If you regard me or consider me or if you take me, if you think of me in this way, now what about that? What do you think people think about you? Yeah. <laughs> Good thing to think about, huh? How do you regard your brother? What do you really think about him? You look at him and say he's a nutcase? Or do you say, oh, there's... There's somebody, there's a brother or sister. I, I, I value them. I want to be able to be that think like them. Yeah. I count them valuable in my trick of faith. See, there's some people that are professed Christians that I can really easy do without. Mm -hmm. They're like weights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. And some people that really aren't weights are considered weights. Mm -hmm. Some people have tremendous kingdom advantages are considered a pain in the neck. Yeah. So he breaks down, if you count me, how do you consider me? How do you, how do you feel about me? And when Paul had something, regarded someone highly, he always said something about him. He'd say something about him. And he admonished the believers to do the same thing. To the Thessalonians, for example. He said, we beseech you. That means we're not going to let this go. Mm -hmm. I'm pressing this matter home now. I'm beseeching you. Know them that labor among you. Be familiar with them. And are over you in the Lord. The reason they're over you is because they've been where you haven't been. They take you there if you follow them. See, that's... Amen. That's the over. It's not like a like an authoritarian type thing. The leading type. Are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love. Why? For their work's sake. Now there's some people I don't they don't have a work's sake. There isn't that's not a facet of their life, a work's sake. So I, 
So you, the only thing you can think of him is he emotionally or as a friend or something like that. But to, for works, what are they doing? Works. Nobody is really over anybody else in the body of Christ who's not working. Some people just fill a position. That's all they do. And they're called leaders, you know, and they have a special office and so forth. Standing very highly for the work's sake, and 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 be at peace among yourselves. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Before he finishes the sentence, he throws that in. Be at peace among yourselves. So Philemon's regard for Paul was not based upon what he heard about him, or because he felt he's, he's a good friend. It was based upon his labors in the kingdom of God. Now, if you count me to be your head, no. no. If you consider me to be over you, no. <laughs> if you consider me a partner. <laughs> now, this is an apostle, not just an apostle. He came not one whit behind any other apostle. And he labored more abundantly than any of the rest of them. So this is who was saying this. If you caught me a partner or a fellow or we have things in common. Some versions say friend. That's, that's bad. Strike an X through that. The word partner is translated partner, associate. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're working side by side. Yeah. Comrade, we're in a war together. A companion in doing something. Mm -hmm. That's what a partner is. Yeah. We're, we're, we're doing something together. And translating the word friends, the Living Bible does, that's wholly out of order. There's no way you can make this word mean friend. No way. Even though I don't doubt he was a friend, but that's not what this is talking about. Yeah. Actually, unity is really based on everybody doing something. It's the unity of the faith, every joint supplying. See, it's actually unity is when everybody is functioning. Amen. That's what makes for unity. It is that we will all believe the same thing. Yeah. And that's necessary, but it, that's not what makes for unity. Mm -hmm. when, the things, when everything's working together. For a, for a common cause and purpose. Jars on a shelf are not united. <laughs> That's right. A, the same shelf even. But, a, yeah, but, a, but an engine, the parts of an yeah, engine working united. together, they're united. Yeah. That's, the, that's why the body of Christ is referred to as a living. It's a living. It's a little body. A living yeah. body. Not a statue. Mm -hmm. It's not a statue that emulates a body. It is a living Functioning body. If you count me a partner, mm -hmm. that word that translated partner is used ten times in Scripture, and it always denotes intimate involvement with mm -hmm. one another. For instance, Jesus charged the people of his day with being partakers, that's the same word, partner, partakers in the blood of the prophets. So here's people separated by hundreds of years from other people. They kill the prophets. They partnered in. Yes. Partnered in that. Instead of James and John, they were partners with Peter in the fishing trade. I mean, they fished together. Yeah. In fact, when they caught a haul, boat, their boats were kind of at the same place at the same time. Paul spoke of those who were partakers of the altar. See, they're, they're in the same function, working together. Or companions of them. Hebrews 10.33 the same word. Companions. That is, you're experiencing what they're experiencing. You're going through the thing in a sense with them. You're participating together the same thing. Even though... It doesn't mean you're in the furnace, at the same furnace at the same time. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that you are, we are both participating in the work of the Lord. We're both working on the same project, God's project. And we're partakers of the divine nature. See, it's, it's a together. 
So this is not a term that means we believe the same thing, although that is involved. It means we're doing the same thing. We're living for the same reason. We're engaged in the same purpose. Mm -hmm. We're doing what God's doing. We've been, we're under God's employee, play employee, mm -hmm. and, and we're working on what God's, what God's doing. Work us together with God, co-laborers yeah. with the Lord, so forth, as it's stated. You should know that there are many professing Christians who simply are not engaged in the work of the Lord. They couldn't be called partners. Yeah, that's right. Some might think of the word like colleagues or but partner. I like that. Yeah. You count me a partner. What you're doing there in Colossae for the Lord, if you consider that I, I'm working with you in that, what I have to offer will contribute to yeah. to what you're doing. And what you're doing contributes to what you consider me a partner. If that's the case. Now he doesn't he doesn't say, I know that you consider me as a partner, although I don't question it, he probably did. But by because he's reasoning, see, he says, now if, I'll think about it. I know Philemon said, well, yeah, well, yes. Goodness, I consider you a partner. I consider you a brother in the Lord. We're working together with God. I consider that. He says, all right, if that's the case, then receive Onesimus as myself. That means Onesimus had been productive, too. Or he wouldn't have said that. Yeah, that's right. See, he said he would. Onesimus was not just a Christian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, today people are satisfied when they hear, "Well, he's a Christian or she's a Christian or whatever that means." Yeah. But this kind of talk isn't in the Scripture. Yeah. Right. So and so was a Christian. That's what the world said yeah. about the believers. But Christian means follower of Christ. That's what they observe. These are followers of Christ. Yeah. Here's what Paul said about Onesimus in Colossians 4 9. He said he's a faithful and beloved brother. Concerning activity, he was faithful. Concerning his status, he was a brother. And since we're all in one family, you can receive him just like you receive me. Oh, my place in the body of Christ is different than that of Onesimus, but we're all members of the same body and members one of another. Amen. So you receive him just like you receive me. That makes him a partner. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's a potent reasoning. You know, you have to kind of ponder it for a while, but Onesimus was a runaway slave. I don't know how long he'd been converted. But to think of that, think of what Paul said here. Receive him mm -hmm. just like that was me coming back. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's how you receive him. He's a, that's reason. He's appealing with reason. He's appealing to Philemon. See, that's a strong, mm -hmm. to a sensitive heart, that's a strong reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. You mean that's what Paul thinks about Onesimus? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to welcome him back, that's for sure. Yes, amen. This is also teaches you it's good to share your reasons. It's good to share them. Yes, amen. It's good to remind people mm -hmm. we're members one of another. Yeah. Don't forget, brethren, we're part of each other. Yes. Yes. Philemon wasn't in union with Paul, then Paul wouldn't have been able to say this. That's right. Mm -hmm. well, that's if, right, if, amen. If they weren't meshed together like God and his church, then he wouldn't have been able to say, receive him as you would receive That's me. That's right. And since they were, he was able to. I don't know if you've ever had occasion to speak like this. Maybe you, maybe you will. Maybe, maybe the time will come when you'll be, be promoting the reception of another brother or sister that someone doesn't realize what's happened to them or they only know their past or something like this. And, but they know you. So you could use this kind of reasoning. Say, we said, no, I receive. I know he used to be this. I remember. I remember. I remember when he was that too. 
He's not that anymore. Now he's a faithful and beloved brother. Well, there's some people I've had, I've had to say this because people didn't believe. Come on now, I remember that guy. I said, no, no, he's not the same. Receive him like you receive me. Amen. And he goes a little further, boy. He says, now if he has wronged thee, or owes thee aught, put that on my account. Now this is reasoning. He's reasoning. Notice how carefully he considers any wrong. He doesn't say, if he did you any wrong, just like swallow it and go on your way. That's not what he says. Right. He doesn't know if any wrong had been done to Philemon, but he wants Philemon to know he doesn't condone wrong being done to Philemon, no matter who did it. Right. He is concerned about it. And I'm considering if there's any debt... If he stole something, or I'm not asking you or telling you, just forget about it. I'm saying I don't want you to be put at a disadvantage unnecessarily, Philemon. If he has wronged thee or hurt you or harmed you in any way or done you in any injustice or defrauded you of anything or injured you, was dishonest with you, or cheated you, or has caused you loss. Maybe he was supposed to work 10 hours a day and he worked a half hour. He wronged you. when That was wrong. He wronged you. Maybe he took something from you. As used here, wrong means to act unjustly or wickedly wasn't right. If you've been treated any way that wasn't right, he doesn't specify the wrongs now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't doubt for a moment that Paul knew about some of these wrongs because he converted Onesimus. Mm -hmm. He begat Onesimus. So I'm sure that in the conversion process, some kind of confession went, took place. Yeah. John the Baptist baptized the people that confessed their sins at Ephesus when they burned their books, they confessed their deeds. And so I'm sure that Paul knew some of the details here. But he carefully avoids them. <laughs> he carefully avoids them because the point isn't here to dredge up these details. The point is we're trying to we're trying to promote the reception of Onesimus as a brother in Christ, a faithful and beloved brother. It appears that Paul yes. is trying to remove any kind of obstacle That's or it. any kind of inroad that the enemy would have to keep Philemon and Onesimus Amen. Mm -hmm. one with exactly. Amen. Mm -hmm. Very good. And it might not be that Philemon had any hatred. Maybe Philemon was ready to forgive. Maybe he'd already done some thinking about this. Uh -huh. We don't know. But he see it's, he phrases it so that covers all these all these situations. You know, this form of reasoning lends itself to the consideration of Christ crossed. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. <laughs> This is Amen. what imputation is. Mm -hmm. Amen. And he took our wrong unto his account and became responsible for it. Amen. Now, notwithstanding all that, it is possible for one person to sin against another person. And the scriptures speak about it. But one person sinning against another person, and I give you some texts there. Jesus even spoke about someone sin against you, or if you have ought against your brother. Paul said this, particularly people of a weak, believers of a weak conscience. A weak conscience meant they're babes in Christ and they had difficulty discerning good and evil. That's what weak conscience means. He said, but when ye sin against the brethren, sin against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Whew. That's a strong word there. That's a strong word there. Maybe you uh, have been sinned against. Someone did you wrong. What they did was wrong. Don't take it personally. They did it against Christ. Well, that's what he said. Particularly, that's just a weak Christian. 
So say it again. So he recognizes he recognizes the validity of one person doing something wrong to another person. He doesn't sweep it under the rug. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this, this wrong it's done primarily against the Lord. It, well, it's sin, and it it uh, created an enmity. For this occasion here. It would seem like there there was a reason for a certain enmity between Onesimus mm -hmm. and Philemon, as far as the conditions upon which Onesimus left. Mm -hmm. However, Paul here is establishing a good foundation upon which fervent charity yeah, for amen. the brethren mm -hmm. and the bond of peace can be developed. Amen. See this cast of fresh light on uh, maintaining the bond of peace, and maintain love for the bread. This uh, sheds light on it. There are things that can happen that might look to intrude upon this. But then if the person is repentant, I mean, it may really have been like living with your father's wife. I mean, it really might have been really bad. But if a person comes back to Christ, there is really a recreation that takes place yeah, right. and a change that takes place. And now the, the person can be received that was formerly just rejected. Yes, Great truth to see. Now, if, he's, uh, if he owes the ought or is in debt some way to you, well, the Living Bible says if he's stolen anything from you. See, there is such a thing as an indebted person, one person indebted mm -hmm. to another person. There is such a thing as this. Paul said, owe no man anything. No, I don't. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. See, there is a debt that believers have to one another that can't be paid fully, can't be fully paid. All of their debts are to be avoided. Someone says, well, yeah, but wait a minute. What about if you have to buy a house and you got these 20, 30 years of payments? So I say this because some people actually bring this up. What about that? Well, here's where contracts and agreements and covenants come in. You agree to pay every month. Owing a debt is when you didn't pay the month. That's how you have to look at it. So this isn't it doesn't mean never buy a house or never buy anything that you go in debt, long-term debt for. What it means is make arrangements for the proper dispelling of the debt. In the text before us, Paul will not ask Philemon to ignore mm -hmm. if if Onesimus owes him anything. He doesn't say, no, just just forget just forget about it. Instead, put it on my account. Charge that to my account. Charge it to me. Charge what he owes to me. This is put that on my bill. It's another way of saying impute it to me. The word put comes from a word meaning to reckon or set to one's account, lay to one's charge, impute. But it's only used this time, one other time. It's only used one other time in the Bible, that particular word. For until the law centers in the world, but sin is not imputed. There, that's the word. Here it's oweth the ought. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. What's that mean? In the context of Romans 5, where that is stated, it means that people don't die before, before the law. People didn't die because they sinned. They died because Adam sinned. And the same is true today. Even though there were judgments of death, I understand. But death passed upon all men because Adam sinned. Where there's no law, there's no transgression. That's why God is able to tolerate 
that age before the law, when there was, well, he broke forth at the flood to show his nature. But this is how God is. If there's no prohibition, it has to be really bad before God judges it. Now there is, pro now there is. I mean, that, that's long gone, that age. Put it on my account. I'll, I will repay it. Says you got this in my own writing. I'm, I'm writing this down by hand. I will repay it. Now, this kind of payment can't be legislated. Philemon could never say, Paul, you are responsible for this. See, they couldn't. He couldn't say that. This has to be voluntary. I'll pay it. Even, even though I didn't run the bill up, I'll pay it. Isn't this what the Good Samaritan did? Yeah, right. To the man he found half dead? He, he paid to get him well, and he gave the innkeeper the money, and he said, oh, if, you, if any, you run up a further bill when they come by, I'll pay that. Mm -hmm. Now, you got to be selfless to do this, you understand. Now, this must have had a profound effect upon Philemon. I put, try to put myself in Philemon's place, and having Paul the Apostle say, if there's something that's owed you from somebody else, I'll pay it. Wow. <laughs> You'd have to be pretty hard. Yes. You have something over there? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I seriously doubt that, that uh, Philemon uh, <laughs> offered any uh, love amounts of debt for Paul to pay him. Oh, and amen. Paul was vouching for Onesimus as his, his conversion, the validity of his conversion. That's right. And this, uh, this approach at uh, remedy this of, of, of Paul it would, would be beneficial for both Onesimus and and Philemon amen it's, it's like a it's like the Lord Lord Jesus bringing us to the to to the father saying I've, right. I've paid their paid their debt He's amen. Us to the amen. Father. Paul's commending <laughs> him to Philemon but too in, in talking about <clears throat> The debt of Onesimus, Philemon, no doubt, is reminded he had a debt also. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. The way that Paul said it was in a way that would guilt him to remembering those things. Remember when you did this, you know, the Lord that took that right. He didn't say it. He said, if. He said, I mean, if. Anything. See, if you count me a partner. Mm -hmm. If you don't, well, this, it, this isn't going to happen. You see what he's saying? He said, this is the condition. If you count me as a partner, if you can't do this because of what you think of Onesimus, do it because of what you think of me. Is that an incentive for godliness? Huh? Is that an incentive for godliness? There may be someone that you know has been doing better, and you, but the other people can't see it. They just can't separate their past from them. And you say, look, and you've lived the kind of life you can say, look, I vouch, I vouch for this person, and the same way you receive me, receive them. Yeah. An unholy person can't say this. A person whose affection is not set on things above, they can't say this. A person who's living for God can't say this. They can't really plead for somebody else. They can't do it. But Paul, uh, Paul could. Now, the principle of putting the debt of one person on another person is woven throughout salvation. Amen. There's another word used for impute, but it's woven when it comes to salvation, but it's woven throughout it. This was done when the iniquity of us all was laid on Christ. Yes. Amen. That's Isaiah 53. It was laid on Christ, which means Jesus became responsible for the debt. Yes. Amen. There really was no difference looking at from a legal viewpoint, there was no difference between Jesus' 
committing these sins and the people committed them. He was just as though he had committed them. He had to pay the debt for them, even though he had no part of committing them. They took the debt and put it on somebody else. God did. Well, in another place, he did spell this out pretty, pretty detailed when he said, forgiving one another even as God, for, for Christ's Christ sake, sake, forgave us. That's right. The same manner. Mm -hmm. And for that reason. See, this is a... This is a pillar of the apostolic doctrine mm -hmm. concerning Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, but this, i got to be careful how I say this, but this emphasis on Jesus' lovingness, I think, has gone overboard. Mm -hmm. Jesus loved God more than he loved you. Yeah, right. That is the reason right. he gave himself. <coughs> He loved us and gave himself for us, but it was because of God's requirements, because the debt was legitimate. That's right. Sin had created a legitimate debt. Amen. God will not just erase sin or pretend like it didn't exist. Yes. Yeah, now you, you couple this with the, the parable that Jesus gave yeah. about the servant who owed much and yeah. the servant that that owed a little to the one that had been forgiven much. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Jesus did it for the Father's sake. That that doesn't that doesn't negate no. the love that He has to His people, <clears throat> because known unto God are all His works from the foundation. There was a cause there that was rooted in. The, the nature of God, Amen. And and He does have, He does have a a desire unto the works of His hands, but the primary love is between in, yeah. in the Godhead itself, and then everything flows from that. But now you have, you take this back to Philemon and Onesimus, and you have Philemon to forgive Onesimus. Now, how much does Onesimus owe Philemon? in comparison to how much Philemon owes Christ. That's right. Amen. And that's that's what Paul that, is drawing out here also. Amen. That's the potency that of it. It is impossible that, that anyone could offend us <coughs> in the same measure as we have offended God. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's, it's reasoning that if it's received is invincible. Yeah, Jesus, God exacted the payment from Jesus. Amen. There wasn't anything pleasant about it. That's right. And Jesus, knowing God the way he did, knew what the payment That's would be. That's right. Yeah. So in the garden, when he's sweating, as it were, great drops yes. of blood, he's considered, he knows what the payment is. And so this time, he, he, he drew back. Not because he didn't want to do what the Father said. That's why he went forward. But he knew what it was going to that's cost. That's right. Yes. Nevertheless. Yes, right. That's right. Well, now, Nothing. Jesus, it, before he took on, uh, came in the likeness of flesh as the Word, you have to remember, mm. he hates sin as much oh, yes. as yeah. God oh, yes. does. And yeah. he was doing it for the Father. But yeah. now there's a certain satisfaction to him in the putting away of sin. It's yeah. not under Amen. his nose anymore either. Amen. Yeah, yeah he, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. That's First right. uh -huh. Peter one twenty four. But when he came out of the grave, they were not in that body. Right. <laughs> he had put away. The second time without sin. Yeah. See, he's done with sin. That's right. When we say that Jesus did this out of his love for the Father, that was the motivation. Mm -hmm. Jesus did love us and give himself for us, but that's underneath. Uh -huh. that's, right. that's underneath this superior. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to look at his foundational, that's the love of he had for God was the foundation that was sufficient enough to compel him to do this. Mm -hmm. Just his love for the people, that wasn't a sufficient incentive mm -hmm. That's right. to do this. But the love for the Father. Yeah. Now you've got to see that this is the way it is with you too. Yeah. Your love for somebody else is not sufficient incentive mm -hmm. to conduct yourself properly toward them. Mm -hmm. 
But if you have a love, deep and profound love for God, that will give the incentive to bless them that curse you and pray for them that despitefully use you. Amen. You can't make yourself do that. Yeah. Yes. Um, back when um, we were talking about Jesus, um, who died for us, says, who paid for our debt as well as Paul. I was thinking, <clears throat> Paul was um, so selfless enough that he but, um, was willing to pay his the, our brother's debt. And I connect that with um, Jesus was so selfless that he was willing to do his Father's will to pay our debt. That's right. Amen. So given Jesus said it this way, he said that the world may know that I love the Father. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So Jesus bore the full responsibility for the debt. Amen. Which is exactly what Paul said he would do. Uh -huh. He doesn't end there. He's reason remember he's reasoning what he's doing. He's reasoning. So you can't just state a bunch of uh, certain laws, certain procedures, and that ends the matter. He's reasoning, see. Albeit, other verses say, not to mention, or lest I should mention to you, or of course, or to say nothing of it. There's just something else I want to bring up here. In order to induce Philemon to receive Onesimus in a, in a friendly and amiable manner, Paul does not bring out his strongest legal arguments. Now you ought to do this, and if you don't do that, he doesn't bring those out. Although he could, he could have brought, he could have brought them out. We ought to love one another, forgive one another. You know, he he could have brought all those out, but he doesn't address them from the standpoint of obligation. But he uses great wisdom. And he sprinkles the admonition with the remembrance of something that he knows will provoke yes. Philemon. It's the appeal to spiritual reasoning, which proceeds from spiritual understanding. For example, in reasoning with the Jews in Antioch of Assyria, Paul did not draw their attention to the great love or with God hath loved us. <laughs> mm -hmm. He didn't bring that one out. He didn't show the marvelous provisions of salvation. He didn't bring that up. Instead, he reasoned with them about the history of the Jews and how they'd received every conceivable advantage, how they spurned God, and how God finally sent him a Savior and he was there to announce the good news. See, he reasoned with them from a completely different point of view. Why? Because they were different than Philemon. There isn't a standard way to reason about Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. It depends who you're talking to. When reasoning with the Athenian philosophers, he didn't appeal to the love of God, or the long suffering of God, or the grace of God, or the willingness of Jesus to die, mm -hmm. or the necessity of responding to grace. Mm -hmm. Instead, in his reasoning, mm -hmm. because of who he's talking to, he reasoned about the origin of man, how man was strategically placed, and how he's going to give an account to God in the day of judgment. That's the reasoning he finds. <laughs> because of who he's talking to. Why does Paul reason the way he's reasoning here? Because of who he's talking to. He's talking to Philemon, who he knows is a devoted follower of Christ. And Paul spoke with Felix. He reasoned with him. He didn't reason with him about the unreasonableness of sin and the, how it's good to yield to the love of God. And he reasoned with him about righteousness. You've got to be righteous. Temperance. You've got to control your life. And, and, the, and the day of judgment. Why did he reason that way with him? Because of who he was reasoning with, Brother Jason. Yeah, this is why most so-called evangelistic presentations are usually ineffective. Right. The people delivering it don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to reason or think independently. They don't understand the people that they're talking to. They don't understand how to even know where the people are. So there's all these canned kind of yeah. the Romans road or the mm -hmm. you know, in the Christian church it was the five finger exercise. You know, believe, repent, yeah. confess. You know, all that. 
why a lot of evangelism is ineffective. It is. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's not reasoning, see. It's not reasoning. You'll note the absence of a unique method of reasoning about Christ. It just depends who you're talking to. Are they mature in Christ? Or do you reason a little bit differently? Are they people that are unstable? And, and you reason a bit different. Are they hardened sinners? You reason another way. Are they people that are just kind of in, they're in a quandary, they don't know what to do? And you reason another way. And how do you say, how do I figure all this stuff out? You've got to walk in fellowship with Christ. You have to live by faith and you have to walk in the Spirit. And in the process of living unto the Lord, He directs all of these things. You'll say, whoa, this, this, I can't throw the pearls out here. Mm -hmm. That's right. uh -huh. yeah? Some people make a mistake and they do. Then just like Jesus said, they turn and rend you. Yeah. Tear you up because of it, see? All this involved in reasoning. If we're speaking about a believer's pilgrimage in general, you reason a certain way. As yes, strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts that war. It's just reasoning. Yeah. See, it's not. It's technically it's not like a commandment. Mm -hmm. It's reasoning. See, because the kingdom of God is based on solid reality, mm -hmm. and when you reason, you're you're. You're dealing with components that are absolute realities. Mm -hmm. So instead of like a commandment, you're presenting something that enables a person to see the truth and then act upon it. Now I said, uh, <coughs> albeit, besides, that's, that albeit and besides are taken from one single word. It means to owe in return or, or likewise owe. In other words, you receive something from me and now it's time to give back. Yeah. Quite an arresting statement. Now this, Paul's not like overstating something or stating a lie or something that's not true or hyperbole. Paul would not use a lie or a hyperbole to motivate somebody. But see, people do today. I remember the year of the sad stories at invitation time. You remember those? That you, <laughs> the sad stories that you would get the people to cry and would turn the lights down low and tell these sad stories. Man lost his dog or something, and boy, you get the people to cry, and then you give the oh yeah, this was done now, brother. This sounds like a fable. Believe me, it wasn't a fable. People did this. This was dominant. All denominations practically, and they induced results, but they just yeah. weren't good results. I was very resting that Paul speaks like this. You. You, you owe your own self to me. Now, you've probably heard people say, somebody brought someone to a right decision, brought someone to Christ and said, that wasn't me, that wasn't me. Praise God, it was the Lord, it wasn't me. They thought they were really glorifying God and saying that. Well, they weren't. Mm -hmm. This is what Paul says. You don't owe me now. You owe the Lord. The Lord's the one that did it, Philemon. It wasn't me. Don't be heaping honor on me. Don't be thanking me. Don't be, don't be thinking about receiving me. It was the Lord that did it. wasn't. See, there's people reasoning this way now. And it sounds really humble. But it's not. It's stupid. It's not humble. Jesus said, He that reapeth receives wages. This is the way the kingdom of God works. You work in God's field, you get wages. Yes, amen. That's what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. He meant it. <laughs> Paul said there's a coming a day when the faithful stewards will be praised by God. What he said. Here's something Paul said to the Corinthians just to kind of stir them awake. He said, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many 
fathers, for in Christ Jesus I begotten you through the gospel. So you've got a lot of people been coming through there teaching you. They got you all confused. <laughs> and now you're, you, you've been crucifying the Lord afresh. You didn't get this from me, only I begat you. See, some people would be afraid to say this now. Technically, it was like, technically God used the word of God, which Paul spoke to beget. If you want to get down to the nitty-gritty of it, he begat us by his word. We are begotten by, his, by the word of truth, the scripture says. But it was spoken through Paul. And Paul says, you owe me your life because of this. See, Paul was commissioned. Open their eyes. He didn't say try and open their eyes. Open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, the power of Satan unto God, so they can have their sins forgiven and receive the inheritance. That's a tremendous commission. I've never heard anyone refer to that as a great commission. But that, that was a great commission. Amen. And Paul did do this. In the case of Philemon, he turned him from darkness to light. He turned him from the power of Satan unto God. I forgot the. Well, they and they receive and when they receive forgiveness mm -hmm. and inheritance. And so he said, "You, you owe me your life." That's right. I have, by the grace of God, had some early instructors that reminded me of something like this. Yes. And I'm very, uh, very grateful for it. You say, well, wasn't it really God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit that did the work? Yes, they are the real workers. The real workers, foundational workers, are God, Jesus, and Christ. But, but the members of the body are joined to all three of them. Mm -hmm. right. And God is so gracious, the person he works through him through, he gives them the credit. That's right. Amen. <laughs> How about that? Gives them the credit, even though it's him that worked. Yeah. And, and, and they'll tell you it was Christ. They'll, they'll tell you. They'll disclose it. But the, the, you see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. they, they, they don't like say, well, you worship me. Like Paul said, follow me as I follow you Christ. Follow Christ. Yeah. Paul did say who? Who is Paul and who is Apollos? Yeah. Yeah. Ministers by whom you believe. That's right. Believe. Amen. And so there's a there's a there's a discretion mm -hmm. in in how the the case is presented. Mm -hmm. uh, but Paul said, "He he that is spiritual judges all things." Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so there there would be other people. There were other people, Dallas, that Paul knew that he had communications with that he couldn't speak like this to. Him. Oh no. Yeah. That he, yeah. ju oh, he no. judged that. That Philemon was sensi sensible mm -hmm. and, uh -huh. and sober right. about yeah. about the kingdom, so he could reason. That's what this way. that's what drove this. He knew Philemon mm -hmm. would see this. Amen. Philemon was advanced enough. He knew, he knew that his salvation is of the Lord. Amen. But he knew that God uses means, mm -hmm. and that when he uses means, God, Jesus insisted that the people he sent out be received. And he went so far as if they don't receive you, pack up and leave. Mm -hmm. That's how serious he was about it. Now, actually, it was it was God and the Spirit working through them, see, but that didn't change the fact that these were real people mm -hmm. that God, by whom we believe. Yes, That's amen. how it stated in 1 Corinthians 3. Mm -hmm. And God has given every man, every man those. So Paul, again... He's speaking more freely because of the person he's speaking to. He, he could, would, couldn't say this to some other people. They, just, they were not close enough, mm -hmm. not tuned in enough That's to the right. things of God. He couldn't. And you want to learn this. If you haven't learned this yet, you want to learn this. That One of the penalties of living at a distance from God is you just don't hear a lot of things. There's some things you can't receive. They're not intended to be shouted at a distance. Mm -hmm. They're intended to be close up. Amen. Yes, Brother Jason. Mm -hmm. Seems to me this this whole this whole passage here is a 
it's Paul giving an excellent example to the body of Christ yeah. for all time mm -hmm. of what it means for your life to be completely conformed to the gospel. That's good. Now, Paul said he was a preacher of the gospel. He, mm -hmm. he, he devoted his life to proclaiming this message. But here we see this is, this is a very personal yeah. application Amen. in Paul's own life of the implications of the gospel he preached. Mm -hmm. And so it, it seems to me that if, if we really believe the gospel and we really understand the gospel, we apply ourselves to it, mm -hmm. our lives will begin to conform to That's the gospel. Right. Mm -hmm. For example, if you feel like you have trouble forgiving people mm -hmm. who sin against you, if you do a little investigating here, it may be you don't understand the gospel as well as you thought. Very yeah. good. Uh -huh. Or maybe you don't believe it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Like you should believe it. Mm -hmm. And so this this is a this is a very extremely important thing principle to keep in mind because we we often see people like maybe whole churches of people like there's a church they're all fighting with one another <laughs> and there there's no unity and they don't love one another and they're bitter and angry and they won't forgive one another. See, it doesn't matter what they say about what they believe mm -hmm. about the gospel. Yeah. They don't believe the yeah, gospel. Right. Or they don't understand the gospel. Mm, that's right. Because if they did, it would conform to their living, and they'd be forgiving one another and loving one another, etc., etc. Amen. Mm -hmm. And Amen. Paul, Paul was an expert. After he said things like this, he would turn around and say, it is God that works in you, Moses. Yeah. He was an expert of bringing that out. Yeah to the people and telling them why they were where they were. But now when it comes to forgiving another and interpersonal relationships, you can't have some brethren you receive and some brethren that you don't. That's right. Real brethren. We're talking about real brethren now. Anyone else have something you'd like to say tonight? Brother Aaron? How about the he that judgeth all things? I've been doing a lot of thinking about that recently. That it's very common for a, a, the, a pre the gospel to be presented uh, to those that are outside in such in, in a manner in which it should actually be preached to those who are inside mm -hmm. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And I can give you an example of this is like the uh, the presumption of the unconditional love of God that's mm -hmm. preached to those who are outside, and then. There, there's a there's a harsher tone that is preached to those who are inside because they're not going and and preaching to people on the outside like they know they should be, and it's it's kind of it's it's actually yes. reversed. That's a that's a, an effect a result of not judging all things. It's those that are on the outside. They they get like what Paul preached on Mars Hill. God created all things. He created you. You sin, and God's going to judge you. And then those that are on the inside, see, you, yeah. they they need addressed uh, what the new creation that's in them. That's right, and, amen. And it's almost it's it's rather astounding that th those things are not not exactly. You understand what I'm saying? It's almost like they're getting turned around. Yes, I know what you mean, Mister Burr. Yeah, thinking about the scripture of spending and being spent for the brethren. I had always seen that as a more direct ministry of one brother to one brother, but I see an added dimension to that tonight, that it's also a ministry of reconciliation. That's right. That's what Paul was offering to do. He was willing to be spent That's for right. the reconciliation of these two other brethren on his behalf. And so then all these other scriptures of laying down your life for the brethren, we had also yeah. to lay our lives down. All these things take on a new dimension. Yes. We see that there's... It's a ministry of reconciliation as well. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like saying, now look, if anyone has to be inconvenienced, let it be me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what he was saying. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Speaking of the dimension of this, there there is the aspect in which it is uh, like brother <coughs> to brother here. Mm hmm but it's much bigger than that. Yes. This ripples through the entire body. Mm -hmm. We have, we live generations past this, and it's it's still rippling to oh, us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. You, nothing done in the body of Christ is so isolated so as not to affect the whole. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. In some, in some way, in some measure, because you know, um, Brother Jason mentioned whole churches. 
where, well, if it's just a couple of brethren that can't get get along, like Euodius and Syntyche, get that out there, mm -hmm. and or whether it's an entire congregation where there's a lot of backbiting and bickering and harsh tones and and hard feelings and stuff, it has an effect on the church. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes, Brother Jason. Yeah, let, let it also be said, you can't be reconciled to everybody. That's right. There, <coughs> excuse me. If there are people that are, aren't reconciled to God, you can't be reconciled Amen. to them. So, That's right. so not everybody who says, I'm a Christian, see. Mm -hmm. this Again, you have to reason. You have to reason on this. He, Paul wasn't reconciled to Alexander the coppersmith. Mm -mm. He was not. Or Janie's or... Amen. Amen. I forget that. He did. Yeah, Hymenius and Philetus. Yeah. And Hermogenes. Yeah, well, one of, one of the marks of the ungodly is that they're implacable. They they mm -hmm. can't be yeah. they can't be appeased. They won't make peace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm talking about people who think they're they're Christians mm -hmm. and think that this is somehow acceptable or excusable. It is not. No. This is why the Apostle Paul said, as far as it depends on you. That's so right. That That's you. right. Amen. So it doesn't all depend upon you. No. <laughs> no, it doesn't. So sometimes the Sanhedrin shouts you down anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if it wouldn't have been for Paul, um, Philemon wouldn't have been reconciled to God. That's what he's saying. That's you owe right. me. Uh, and yet, he, he's wanting him. Paul's not saying, not invoking this to gain some benefit for himself. It's for Onesimus. Paul's <laughs> mentioning it to gain benefits for Onesimus. That's right. Amen. But see, this is when it's legal. <laughs> Amen. See, this, this doctrine of, uh, remember whenever it may still be around, uh, they were saying you have to forgive everybody. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It doesn't make any difference whether they spit on your forgiveness and they weren't repentant at all. Uh, it didn't make any difference. You were obligated because you're a Christian to forgive everybody for everything. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And if they if they were waiting to do it again, you uh -huh. still had to be you had to for, forgive them. And I asked a person one time, "Does God expect more of you than He does Himself?" He says, "Who do you know?" What unrepentant sinner do you know God has forgiven? That's and right. no, you don't. It's a transaction. You see that it's a kind of like a, a parallel thought here about this be reconciled to everybody. You can't. Transgression is a transaction and forgiveness is a transaction. Yes. Amen. To be complete, it requires both parties. Now, what you can do is be willing to forgive. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sister Sarah? Um, I thought that um, we are going to be a um, a partner with Christ, and it says in Romans 8, uh, 17, and if children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint, I mean, mm -hmm. joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. Um, I thought because uh, we are going to be with Christ, mm -hmm. so I thought of the scripture and I thought of the... Uh, That's right. Mm -hmm. Very good, Sister Sarah. Amen. 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 You can see 1 Corinthians 13 in this presentation of Onesimus back yes. to Philemon. Yes. Yes, amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Let us not be an excellent example of being the aroma of Christ. The aroma of Christ. Amen. See, this is Christ being magnified in Paul's body. Because Amen. When I mean, you look at these words and you're like, these are things that Jesus would say, like, I will repay it. Put yeah. that on my account. Yeah. And you owe me your life. Yes, those, are, those are like, those are words that Jesus uses. Yeah, that's right. When he uh -huh. speaks to his people. And so. Amen. All right, we'll have a closing word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this text and for the recollections that it has spawned. This is the sort of people we want to be, Father. And we ask for grace to be noble examples 
of Paul in this respect. In Jesus' name, amen.